good afternoon uh, everybody <clears throat> i am tamil edirmuni the chairman of uh, electrical electronics and telecommunication section of the committee of the iesl so today uh, after a uh, brief video it was very attractive and uh, it is something that uh, normally not we are frequently not we are uh, discussing about or, or we, we are we are of course uh, not uh, that much conversant about that because i in our sectional committee we are uh, main, we, we have been doing uh, the power sector and uh, all other things so but uh, uh, we thought of uh, doing this seminar and uh, foremost of all uh, i must welcome dr bandu jayawardhana who is the I guess his speaker today and uh, engineer Avadana Kankanamge, who is the deputy chairman of the sectional committee, engineer Kosana Vidana Patirana, the secretary of uh, the sectional committee, and the moderator, engineer Tanir Suraj, which I will be introducing him, and uh, engineer Sahara Masuk. Uh, this uh, executive, one of the executive committee members of uh, the sectional committee, and uh, all the other participants, I am warmly welcome to uh, this uh, uh, good session of uh, good knowledge sharing. It will be a uh, fruitful session as we have done. Uh, uh, actually, this is the fourth uh, webinar. We have we had been doing uh, hybrid uh, seminars, and uh, this is the fourth one, uh, which I think after six weeks. So we have been uh, doing great uh, in seminars uh, and to know to share the knowledge of uh, uh, knowledge with uh, our members. So I must welcome all the the all the participants, and uh, before. Before moving to our, uh, uh, I will introduce the moderator who is uh, working with him because uh, this is a subject of unknown uh, territory. Uh, so that uh, hope uh, the moderator will uh, do the immense to the uh, subject. Our moderator today uh, in this evening is engineer Tarindu Suraj. He is a robotic engineer graduated from University of Morocco. He worked as a robotic uh, researcher at National Science Agency Australia and received uh, several awards for his uh, researches on localization and mapping. Currently, he is working as the CEO of uh, SRQ Robotics, implementing uh, drone solutions uh, to the local and international market, mainly international market, I, I know him. So uh, it is my privilege to uh, and all the proceedings to engineer Tarindu Suraj. And uh, please carry on with this uh, with this uh, session uh, of knowledge sharing with uh, the subject. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you, Engineer Chamil, for that great introduction. So uh, good evening all. Again, I would like to welcome you all for this great session. And uh, today, session is a really interesting one, which is on usage of sauna for underwater operations. And uh, this is hosted by the Electrical, Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering Sectional Committee of IESL. Uh, so I would like to remind you, uh, this session uh, is followed by a Q&A session. So if you get any questions during the session, you can either use the raise hand option at the end of the session, or you can send us your questions uh, during the session through the chat. So if I'm to uh, introduce a bit about today's session, it is mainly about underwater acoustics, with an introduction to sauna and an illustration of how sauna is used in underwater operations by commercial and military establishments. This presentation elaborates both active and passive sauna, underwater arrays used in ships and submarines, sauna user displays, application of commercial sauna equipment, underwater surveillance and underwater acoustic warfare. So uh, today, uh, our guest of our guest speaker, Dr. Bandhu Jayavardhana, uh, I will give you a bit of introduction to him and his background. 
and uh, he has obtained his bachelor's degree from the University of Maratua and his master's from the University of Technology, Sydney, and his doctorate in uh, astrophysics from the James Cook University, Australia. He has all three decades of experience in systems and software engineering with 20 years experience in onboard systems. And he has worked at University of Technology, Sydney, Alcatel, and Thales implementing these underwater sonar systems for marine-based application. He's also keen in algorithm development and processing radio and other astronomical signals in the domain. So it's time to present your valuable presentation, sir, uh, to our uh, interested audience. Dr. Bandhu, over to you, sir. Thanks, Engineer Tarendu Suraj. Good afternoon, everybody. And very first, I have to thank your president, IESL president, Dr. Lakshay, to get me to do this uh, presentation. And let me share my uh, slides. I think you can see my slides now. So usage of sonar in underwater operations. Here, what I'm, what I'm gonna do is, I just give you an introduction of sonar and give you an uh, sonar application in underwater and commercial and military domain. Let's start. So first one, acoustics. What is acoustics? Acoustics is about vibration, sound and ultrasound and infrasound in many media, gases, liquid and solids. And here we are going to look at acoustics in water. So when we say acoustics, it is basically sound. So we are basically doing sound in water. So it is sonar. What is sonar? Sonar is an acronym which has become a proper noun. And people say sonar wave and stuff, but actually there's no sonar wave. They are acoustic signal. But like radar, it has become a usage, though it is not technically correct. Sonar means using sound in navigation and ranging. So now the question comes, when it comes to underwater, why we use sound? Why can't we use light or radar? First, think about sound. Sound is a transfer signal. And by comparison, it's transmitted well in water. Transmission of electromagnetic waves, such as light and radar, they are very limited. Now look at some uh, numbers. Look at sound speed. Sounds travel about 343 meters per second in air, but in water, it travels 1500 meters per second. So it is pretty fast. And moreover, look at travel distances in water. Light. Light travels about maximum about 100 meters in water. But if you consider depth, it's rarely go beyond, uh, beyond 30 meters. Beyond that, it is pretty dark. Radar, it's same as light. It passes only a few meters. But when it comes to sonar, not sonar, I mean sound, it can travel hundreds of kilometers. So obviously, sound has become the only way if you're going to use any underwater activities. Now let's look at what frequencies we are going to use in underwater. 
If you look at this acoustic frequency diagram, the x-axis, which is in log scale, you can see frequency scores up to 100,000 hertz or 100 kilohertz. So that is the basically sonar equipments, I mean the range of sonar equipments. And the y-axis, it gives you the strength of the signal in each frequency band. If you go to the very top, you can see the, the most powerful of the strength is comes in earthquakes. Earthquakes normally happening in frequencies less than 100 hertz. But then you get the biological noise, which can spread from, from 10 hertz to maybe over 100 kilohertz. Then you get the precipitation, and then you get ships, industry, and activity. That is something we have to look at. So what is in red is man-made stuff. What is in black, they are actually uh, the natural, natural events. Then you get sea ice and stuff. And if you go to the bottom, you can see there are some ocean traps typical ocean traffic, there's a natural ones. And look at this uh, yellow line. They, they, these are sea states. So sea state zero five, it is, I mean, sea state is controlled by wind. So when winds comes, when wind, wind level, wind strength goes up, you can see state state going up. So it increased the spec, spectrum power or the energy. But the, you can see there's a black line going from 140 decibels. Mm -hmm. You know, going going down, so that is the limiting uh, limiting strength of the noise. And if you get anything, any device which emit power more than that limiting line, you it can be detected without doing very sophisticated algorithms. So that is about the. Sona. And when I say sona, I'm really sona frequencies. This sona equipments water, I mean operating generally 10 about 10 hertz to 15,000 hertz. That is the the I mean exclusively it's a majority of sona equipment work. Now let's see. There are two types of sona. Probably you already know. Active so one is active sonar. In active sonar, you transmit pulses and detect the echo or reflection. So it is pretty much the active radar, pretty much similar, but it's operating different frequencies. So we use two types of pulses: continuous wave and frequency modulated. And where we use active sonar. The first one, heavyweight torpedo sonar, torpedo detection and surveillance. So that is something related to uh, military. What is heavyweight torpedo? Heavyweight torpedo is a torpedo fired by a submarine. And on the so this heavyweight torpedo is about six meters long. You probably know. And in the in its head, in the head, it's in head, you have small active sonar unit, which guides this uh, the torpedo. And on the other hand, ships and submarines, they use active sonar to detect torpedo. So you, you make torpedo and you use, uh, I mean, sonar is used in torpedoes as well as we use sonar technology to detect torpedo. And number two is mine detection and sea flow profiling. So this is normally done by ships and also by submarines. And in military wise, there are special uh, ships called mine hunters to do this mine detection. Sea flow profiling done by military as well as commercial entities. The other one is echo sounders. You probably know that it is used for find fish. The other one is underwater telephone. 
So underwater telephone, as the name suggests, it is to communicate underwater. So basically to submarine to submarine, submarine to ship, and submarine or ship to the people who work underwater. So it has about eight kilohertz bandwidth and it can use not only uh, communication, you can send data in, in underwater telephone. So, it, and it probably work for many kilometers. So it is basically, it is very versatile equipment, especially in the military. So the other one is passive sonar. In passive sonar, you listen for sound in the noise background. It is exactly what our ears do. You, you, you stay stationary in most of the cases and listen. And you get what's around you. That is exactly what submarines are intended to do. So they are normally in, in high-mounted arrays, sonoboys and towed arrays. Sonoboys and towed arrays, I will explain it later. And where we use passive sonar? Passive sonar is basically used in submarines. And submarine basically does these functions, classify targets and measure frequencies and other attributes. They track targets and they use passive sonar to do torpedo detection and long range surveillance. In many cases, it is hundreds of kilometers. Now let's go to a couple of commercial applications which use active sonar. First one is echo sounder. Echo sounder is used to determine the depth below the keel of the ship or submarine. And it's mainly used for fishing and hydrography. And logic is simple. You have a transducer which emit the pulse, which reflect back from the bottom. And you assume the, the speed of sound is constant and you know the time. So you can calculate the depth. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, where the sea flow at. And in, in echo sounders, there are two types of echo sound. Single beam echo sound, which used for measure the depth. And you can see in deep water, it is less than 40 kilohertz. In shallow water, it's used the frequencies more than 50 kilohertz. In deep water, frequency is less. It's because its attenuation is high. So you have to use lower frequency. In these echo sounders use continuous wave. The other one is multi-beam echo sound. We use sweep impulses, and it's basically used for sea bottom classification. Look at the frequencies they use. It's 200 to 500 kilohertz. That means its attenuation is high. So this is range is low than the single beam echo sound. And we normally use frequency modulated signal or any specific complex signal for that. Ah, this is, this is the, one of the simplest echo sounders which can use for recreational fishing. You can get this kind of thing less than hundred dollars. And even if you look at that, it says it's fish finder and it gives you the depth and where the fish are. So the next one, if you are traveling in a trawler or ship or any cruise, you can, if you can go to the control room, you can see this type of display. So it is the output of echo sounders, the processing and it's giving the nice display. You have low frequency part and high frequency. Low frequencies give you it is, uh, the features, it's actually what is there, and high frequency give you more detail. 
So you can see from this gra graph, it says there are some fish schools are there and it gives where the seabed. And here we can find some kind of old tree or something. And next time, if you are going on a cruise ship in the passenger area, just look around and you will probably see something like this. The next one. Oil and gas ex exploration in sea. In this case, we use sonar technology as again seismology, and we have to use shock waves. How it is happening? In oil gas exploration, we use air gun. In the old days, we use explosives. We don't. We don't, we don't use uh, explosives anymore. So what happened here is the ship, it create, it create an explosion or air gun and it create typical acoustic waves or sonar waves. And what happened is the sonar waves go down and hit on the, the bottom surface. And then it become seismic waves. So it goes through layers of the Earth's crust. So, and then we go down and it reflects back. And it's come to the surface of the Earth and it become uh, acoustic wave again. And this has been, these waves are collected by tow arrays. What is exactly a toad array? Toad array is a very, very long linear array. And it has many kilometers long and it has lots, lots of hydrophone. So these acoustic, reflected acoustic waves are collected by the these hydrophones, and then it will be processed. And then seismologists can take the decision what is under the seabed. So this is this kind of thing is what it used in to find oil and gas exploration in MANA. So normally there are few companies in the world which, which does this oil and gas exploration. Now I'm going to the non-commercial thing, that is sonar in defense. It is where sonar technology is used in submarines and ships or, or warships. So what's happening here? In this diagram, you can see there is a surface ship, warship, which has active sonar, array there, so it sends some pulses, which is those, so, those, those acoustic signals are marked in blue color, and you can see they have, the signal is being reflected back from the sea mount or fishing areas in, in yellow color. And it can be reflected back from a submarine which is hiding. So if the person has been done properly, these ships should be able to get all the details. So that is how active sonar work in basically in the military. Earlier I mentioned the word sonoboy. What is sonoboy? There are three types of sonoboys. Passive sonoboys, active sonoboys, and special purpose. What does what do they do? They do detection and classification and localization. And it could be omnidirectional and it could be a single and multi-beam. Basically, it does what a submarine does. In, in other, sonoboys, in other words, are the 
very cheap version of submarine. How big is a sonar boy? You can see it is not big. It is something a, a single person carry. How do you deploy sonar boy? Sonar boys are deployed by aircraft. Where you use these uh, sonar boys? If you suspect something is hiding under water, maybe submarine. So rather than using uh, another submarine to find it, you can use sonar boy. Once the fun uh, sonar boy's function is get the sonar signal and send it to the base station. Once its function finished, sonar boys just sink, sink in the sea. It can normally sonar boys consist of three components: a submerge receiver, VHF transmitter, variable length cable. The submerge receiver is the is the one actual sonar boy, and there's a VHF transmitter which transmits the signal to the base station, which could be a ship, maybe a a ground station or maybe a helicopter. And the variable length connects this uh, receiver to the VHF transmitter. So now, how we use sonar in combat scene? I talk about sonar boys. You can see in this diagram, this aircraft uses a sonar boy. And so aircraft can also fire lightweight torpedo. As the name suggests, it is a small version of torpedoes, which is do against submarines. And this lightweight torpedo has a active sonar module in its, in the, in its head. So it works as a weight torpedo. And we have some other dipping sonar, which is normally carried by Helicopters, you can see, and dipping sonar is, you can use this multiple times. It is pretty much similar to sonar boys. And the ships, they have his hull mounted sonar in front, and they can also fire lightweight torpedo. This, all are for this, for everything, they we use sonar. And they have variable depth sonar, you can see VDS and they have this tow array. And ships also use sonar units, which is called decoy, to create some kind of uh, acoustic signal with different frequencies to, you, to confuse the other side or the enemy. And you can see submarines does the same. They use decoys to confuse the other side. So it, and you can see they also use heavier torpedo. So what kind of arrays we use for in sonar? Cylindrical and spherical arrays. Ships use cylindrical arrays. Submarines use both. As the name suggests, cylindrical arrays can look around all 360 degrees. And spherical arrays? Entire sphere, you can see everywhere. And you have planar arrays, which is only in submarines, in left and right, or port and starboard, as the sailors say. And you have towed array. I mentioned that it, and in this picture, you can see the towed array, which is probably many kilometers long. And towed arrays are used in where the sea traffic is minimum because even a boat can damage this array. And arrays use low, uh, low frequency, typically less than one kilohertz, and it can get a target in many hundred kilometers if it properly used. And the active, so it is basically a transmitter you can see, you can find it in ships as well as submarines. And 
then you can find intercept array. They are in submarines. They are actually uh, right, uh, looking at the, uh, the active transmission in the other vehicle, you know, other sea vehicles like ships and submarines. In, although this active array is a transmitter and it is normally received by cylindrical or spherical arrays. You, uh, what I mean is uh, it's a, it is reflection. Then you have mine and obstacle avoidance sonar. It's a special one, high frequency ones. And then you have underwater telephone. I mentioned that before. So now the question comes, why submarines have so many arrays? When you go 100 meters below surface, you cannot see. Basically, submarine is dumb. So it has to get the information around it. So it has to see and it has to listen. So you have to use many arrays. So these arrays does operate in different frequency spectrum. Look at toad array is frequencies less than one kilohertz. Then you, then you have planar arrays. It is between this low frequency and medium frequency. And then you have cylindrical and what uh, spherical arrays, it is in medium frequency. And then active array is the high end of the uh, our audio frequency range. And you have this intercept array, which go which can operate up to maybe around 100 kilohertz. And we use arrays to calculate range. So we need a baseline to calculate range. So we have to use the planar, planar arrays, which is in the left and right sides of the submarine. And you want to find detection and bearing. All the arrays can do that, but cylindrical and uh, Spherical arrays are specially made out for this. Then you have special ones to detect mines. Then you have underwater telephone to communicate. And there are special things. They are, I don't know whether I can say it as array, but they are special hydrophones because arrays are con consist of many hydrophones. These are just a single hydrophones to measure your submarine or, or ships or noise. So we can say it's, a, it's an array of single hydrophone. Next one, where you find these uh, sonar arrays? If you go for a frigate or warship, you can see radar is there. It, it is not underwater, but you can find hull mounted array, a cylindrical array in front of the uh, ship. And you can find in the back, you can find multifunction toad array. So it's a toad array. And in this case, they have some kind of acoustic interest center connected to the toad array. You have your sonar boys and you have hull mounted wide band phone that is underwater phone that, and then you can find these uh, self noise hydrophone AN, WQC2 and sparsely populated volumetric array just to measure the flow rates. So what kind of uh, arrays you find in submarines? Uh -huh. You can find cylindrical array in front. It can be in top or bottom. And you can find cylindrical intercept array on the top. And you can find cylindrical transducer array. So this is a transducer. So it is the where the, your active transmitter. And if you go to the back, you can see toad array. So when you want, you can deploy the toad array 20 kilometers back. And if you are not using it, you can wind it, wound it up, wind it. So left and right side, you can find flank array. These are the plane arrays, which can be used to measure the range of the targets. And this is not an array. This is where your sonar consoles, where your results are coming. You can see it is. Here, there are about five sonar consoles. 
And what is in front? What are those tubes or cylinders? They are torpedoes. So, and if if I say that self noise hydrophones, self noise hydrophones are in in the front or especially in the back, in the both sides, and by default they want to keep these arrays away from the machinery. So they want to keep it away from the back end, which is the propeller and the engine room. This one is not exactly sonar, but I thought I want to put it there. If you look at the front, you can see there are four holes from where they emit their torpedoes. And on the top, they can use these ICBM or intercontinental ballistic missiles, maybe around 2000 kilometer range. And the one I want to show you is that the which is in red, it is called large autonomous underwater vehicle. So basically it is the underwater version of drones. It is really versatile, and the, all the new submarines and new te technology try to get these underwater vehicles because it can operate in many places where traditional submarines cannot operate. And one last thing for these slides: uh, you, if you fire a torpedo or any of these ICBMs, your enemy knows where you are exactly. So you are sub, your function as submarines really loose because submarine is sub, uh, supposed to work discreet or, or uh, as a spying, okay? So it cannot be located by the others. So if you fire a, a submarine, you are done, okay? So you will be the target of the, the other side. So it is not what you can see in uh, your, those tinting books and stuff. It is very sophisticated. So now we go to sonar displays and control. It is your control room where the, where the operators are. So we have many displays. We have broadband and narrow band waterfalls, time and plan position indicator, which is the bird's view of your position or your map. Then frequency azimuth, and there are so many other displays. Mainly they are related to your frequencies, low far demon gates, which use Lloyd mirrors, and so many other things. And the sonar displays as audio. Audio is very versatile thing in underwater because this audio gives your ability to hear what's around that. If you are a trained uh, operator, you can distinguish what sound is there. Whether it's a sub coming from submarine, it's coming from the turbine or the propeller, or whether it is sound of dolphins. So, odor is one of the must have in a submarine as well as in a ship. So, this is the, the control room. It's in practically, it is very packed area. So you can see this uh, in the center, this uh, round one, it is that PPI and uh, you can see one person is using audio and the very end, the one, two, three, fourth display, you can see there's a C, C and, a, and the A. Yeah, so that means this one is operating, submarine is operating in periscope distance. So you have a camera in the top and you, you can see all around. The, the next one is time bearing waterfall display. So this is something you can see. So I just want to describe it, what you actually get from this sonar data or acoustic data. The first one is we called this single one is the instantaneous strength of the signal in, in a cylindrical array. Sorry, I have to. So, so you can see there are two targets and you can see, oh, so bearing from zero to 300 
60. So it's all around you. So there are two targets, and the, the, the one below is we call it a B scan. It is it is a projection of A scan with, with giving weight for diff, you know with different intensities. So it has it is with the time. So you plot with the time, then you can see what actually happened in there. The, so if you look at the target at the the uh, around 350 degrees you can see it has a high it changes bearing very fast so looking at this you can say this is a very fast target or it is very close to the submarine and the other target is pretty much stationary maybe it's running on uh, constant speed in same direction and the bottom you can see there are two things and left and right. And you can see it is something related to frequency. Look at the numbers. And so it is again frequency domain A scan and B scan. So in the B scan, you can see there are a couple of vertical lines. So these are the frequencies. So that means from looking at this diagram, you can see there's a, there's a target which emit this about 3000, maybe around 4000 Hertz. 4,200 hertz or something, you know, that kind of frequency. And it changes speed because you can see the frequency has been changed. And suddenly it disappears. Probably it stopped. So these, so using sonar technology, you can get so many details of the other vehicle. So that is what military want. And this is the PPI display or plan position indicator. You are at the center. So this is pretty much like what you get, get from your active sauna. You send the pass, you get the ref, uh, ref, reflection, and you put it. And from the from your top right hand side, you get your current position, your your position, your own ship value. So your latitude and longitude, and your speed, your heading and course. Of course, heading is the where the ship's noise, but course is something else. If you are in land, course and heading is practically similar, but in the water and air, it is different because in air, it was, it is the air currents and water, it's the water current. So you are moving some directions you are not supposed to go. So that's where our, what we learn in advanced level, relative velocity comes. And in the middle of the, your right side, you can see, it is the details of the target selected. And if you look at C, it is the, it's the bearing. And if you look at the screen and you can see the your own ship going to 148 degrees. So that is the straight upward. And you are noticing your left side bottom. So the target is at about 129. So you can see it's a target number one. And it gives the details of the target. So it gives you a speed, I mean the target speed and where the target is going for and target heading for which direction. So sonar technology can do this everything. So, and I have given you only two displays, but you can have so many displays with all the details. Even if you are, if you can see if something drop on your, the other, submarine or something, you can notice it from your submarine. So with the, all those things can be, you know, understand. And one thing I have to say is that's where the artificial intelligence comes. You have so many details. So you have to classify it. What kind of submarine is that? And maybe the submarine number. So they have in, in a submarine, they have their own database and so many other details. So you have to match the information you get from submarine to what is there. And there's a classifier. In the military, you cannot make a, you cannot make a mistake. If you are sure, you have to say, if you are 100% sure. If you are not sure, you can say, okay, 80% sure. That means you are not 100% sure. So that is where the, your artificial in that old algorithm comes. And this one is another one. So I just put mine and obstacle on this display. 
So it, you are looking at your front and you give you 3D dimension. So you can see your ship is there and you looking at what is in front of the your. So you can see there's some obstacle there. So you have to classify whether it's a mine or some other obstacle. So that is all about the display. So, so far so good. So you, you can do many things from underwater acoustics using sonar technology. But there are issues. Very first one is sound velocity profile. I said that the sound velocity is 1500 meters per second. It's an approximation. It changed. Sound velocity change with temperature, sound velocity, sound velocity is changed with pressure and some, it also changes change salinity. It is the very least amount. And in, in, in you are traveling speed, different places have different characteristics. What you get in uh, Bay of Bengal is not the profile you get in uh, Durban. And sound velocity is also changed with the time and also season. So that is one of the issues. So when you are processing, should take these things into account. Otherwise, the distance and classification will be different. And the other issue is acoustic signal ray path. Sounds, not like electromagnetic waves, which can be deflected by gravitational wave, but, but in this case, sound waves, because of changing of salinity, pressure, and other stuff, you know, sound waves profile, its path change. So it can be bounce, bottom bounce or surface bounce. So when you receive a signal, your sound waves can, can come from many directions. It's a trouble. So your processing should take care of these things. And this one gives a trouble. So you, ha you have a, your ship and it sends so many signals, but the sound waves do not go straight. It bends. So then what happens is submarine can be hide in your sonar working area in the uh, under the shadow zone because sonar cannot find it. And number three is sea state. I mentioned that earlier. Sea state is the state of the sea. In the very early morning, you can see it's very smooth surface and everything works fine. You can see if you are look at the sea, it is very calm. But when the wind picked up, then what happened? The sea status change. So if you travel in a ship or boat, you can see when the uh, sea level change, you, you can see that pitch, which is you going up and down and rolling issues. So if you are doing the sonar, you have to take this into account. So normally we use uh, Jacobian matrices of fourth level. It's a lot of calculation there. So when you go to C state three, you can do this calculation in fair amount, but when you go to C state six, it's a very chaos. It's very hard to get a proper result. So your sonar operations or sonar calculations should take those things into account. And the last one is the noise. I mentioned noise. Every ship or submarine has its own self noise. So coming from the propellers, machine room, and what the sailors were doing inside, and also floor noise, which is the from your left and right side of that, the you know, the water which hit on the ship, and also background noise. Background noise is what is you get there. So it could be natural. Uh, noise or maybe man-made one. Look at this diagram. You can see the so tankers can give 180 decibels. That type of noise there. So seismic survey can go up to 250 decibels. Active sonar platform again go to 250 decibels. But submarines, they are quiet. They are probably about 80 decibels. Very, very quiet. Whatever we do, we have to respect. There are animals there. So we have to keep our noise low. 
is uh, our duty and this is my my last picture it's underwater battle space you can see submarine it is number 5 which can communicate with ships using sonar and all everything other all the activities done by sonar all the signal processing it can see it can hear everything under sonar but it cannot communicate with the outside world to communicate the outside world it have to come to the surface once it in surface it can communicate with the uh, satellites or the or the or the those uh, aeroplanes or something but if you surface come to the surface submarine can be detected by other so it is not safe and it is not advisable and if on the on the undersea you can see there are mines and you can see underwater vehicles and all the other dipping sonars sonar boys and everything everything's underwater and without sonar we cannot do anything under water whether commercial or military and this is something I exactly don't know the answer because I don't know what actually happening in Sri Lanka. So this is my, my idea what how we use SONA in Sri Lanka. We can use ocean economic technology, fishing, mineral, and oil and gas operation. Remember, Sri Lanka, like any other countries, we have 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. So this area is eight more than eight times bigger than Sri Lanka's land area. So there are a lot of resources. And I tell you that could be very expensive. And the number two, so develop nautical charts, look at underwater hazard navigation. And this is something which can be done, especially by universities. And if you want to enhance this uh, signal processing technology. And finding ocean ecosystem. So it is where you are find fish breeding places and low, all the other things. But we have to protect this area. I know that uh, Gulf of Mana is protected ocean ecosystem. And we can use SONA for defense and security. And we can use SONA for tsunamis and all the other hazards. So th this Identification tsunami hazards, which can be done by universities. You don't need that big arrays, big expensive arrays, but all you have to do is the processing. I think I took too much uh, time, but now I want to stop my uh, lecture and then I'm back to the control room to, to the moderator, Mr. Engineer Tarindu Suraj. Uh, thank you very much, Engineer Dr. Bandhu Jayavadha, for this really insightful session on SONA. Uh, and I think uh, now it's time for the Q&A session. Uh, either you can send us the question to the chat or use the raise hand option so that our, one of our hosts can unmute and uh, give you the chance to ask the question yourself. So I think that's one question received at the beginning of the session. Uh, does the speed of sound changes in fresh water and salt water? I think that's uh, covered during the session, but uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Bandhu Javardana, uh, you can ask that question again. Yeah, it, it changed. It's uh, fresh water and salt water, it is changed. And because, and also change with the depth and salinity. Salinity is the least amount, but the, the, the uh, speed of sound greatly change with the temperature and pressure. I think I answered the question. All right. Uh, so uh, now it's your chance. If you have any other concerns or questions for uh, Engineer Dr. Bandhu Javadha, you can raise your hand or send your questions to the chat. So in the meantime, uh, I would like to ask uh, another question, Dr. Bandhu. Uh, when it comes to localization, underwater localization, we know that uh, uh, it would be easier to use to identify the depth uh, when it comes to sonar. 
but uh, how does a submarine tracks its location when it comes to the horizontal frame? Does it use the sonar or? Uh... Okay. So, uh, you know, can you remember I mentioned there are many arrays? Yes. If you use cylinder array, you can find only the direction. It's a very clear direction. But if you use your, the planar arrays outside, so the, it use entire length of the, uh, the submarine or submarine as the baseline. So relative to that, you can process what happened in the, the two ends. So you know from where that, uh, you know the direction, where the, the, the acoustic signal coming, the, you know, wave front. So you know the direction, so you, you can calculate it. So it's basically uh, the, how you calculate, you know, you have two angles, you have the baseline. And on the other hand, if you use active sonar, you can calculate the distance. Right. So uh, another question, Dr. Bandhu. So if we use the active sonar, does it act as a passive sonar for other parties? And are there any other ways than the active sonar that we can use for localization? We use. So if you look at that, uh, you know, that when I use the PPI, you know, the, the diagram, I said there's a target. So it is what you actually see from the active sonar. So active sonar, you transmit the signal and you know the speed, you know the time. So it is synchronized. You know the time difference. So it is like uh, how it works in echo sounder, you can get the distance, but you get the all the details or the frequencies and other stuff from your uh, cylindrical array and you process it. So by processing that, you can find the bearing and all the other, you know, other parameters, you know, where it is intent and it's the depth, height and everything. Right, so uh, there's a second question as well. Uh, does it act as a, you know, a, a passive sauna for other parties when we are using the active sauna? Say that again. Uh, does it act as, if we use the active sauna, does it act as a passive sauna for other parties? If you are in a submarine. Exactly. We... So that is the trouble, you know. So that's why submarines are not supposed to use active sauna. Because if you use active sauna, the other parties can find this. Submarine, but on the other hand, all the warships and also these commercial ships, they use active sonar. So that is the echo sounding. So it is it is for their safety all the time. And those ships are not supposed to hide because everybody can see, you know. So they use active sonar all the time. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bandhu. I think uh, there's a. Uh... One raised hand. Uh... Uh, good evening, sir. Yes. Sir, thank you very much for your uh, fruitful uh, lecture today, sir. So I am Lieutenant Colonel Samarakon from Sri Lanka Navy. So mm -hmm. I want to know that, uh, sir, what are the uh, techniques that modern day submarines use uh, that uh, can be operated without detection of the other uh, sonar objectives, sir? So that means you want how they you how they hide, right? Uh, yes, sir. Such as uh, exactly. that sonar so, operates at, at uh, blind zone. Uh, yes, that, uh, it's a blind zone, other... but yes. but it is a pure luck because submarines uh, by default are made to do spy do spying without being detected. So few things they can do. Normally submarines operate in. Uh, 100 meters to 300 meters. So the lower they go down, it's very hard to detect. And number two is they always looking around what's around that. So normally they they know what's happening basically about at least 10 kilometers around. And probably they know at least 500 kilometers. Basically, you know, it be the toad array, but you can, you, to use the toad array, they have to be in the surface. Okay, so, be, so when they are in underwater, the, the thing, they have minimized the noise, they are going out. And also, if you look at the submarines, the, when they build it, they are outside surface. They won't, they make it the, from the material which can absorb 
the acoustics. So that means there's no reflection. So they are trying to do that as much as possible. And also they have used decoys. So they are sending some, you know, uh, the different frequencies to confuse the other side. So look at, so since oh, maybe you are enemy, but you are trying to, if you imi Im imitate your uh, friendly submarine's uh, signature, then uh, you can fool the other side. Those kind of things being done. And have I answered your question? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Okay, so do we have any other questions? Uh, because uh, time is running out. We have to uh, conclude the session in short time. Since there are no other questions from the audience, uh, it's time to uh, present the token of appreciation to engineer Dr. Bandhu. Javardana, I'd like to invite uh, our committee chairman, engineer Chamil Yadrimanti, to uh, present the token of appreciation to engineer Dr. Bandhu Javardhan. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, oh, for delivering such a wonderful uh, um, presentation and, and uh, Dr. Bandhu Jayavardhana, thank you very much, sir, because this, it has been a new uh, version of uh, uh, the, the new version of presentation, which we have been uh, normally doing uh, with, uh, uh, as I told you, the electricity sect sector. <clears throat> so uh, this, this is actually very much attractive because uh, there are a number of participants i uh, saw that there are about 70 odd participants and it is uh, is the most high, high, highest participants uh, actually uh, we had uh, uh, experience so so that's uh, then uh, it is a it is a it is a successful presentation which has attracted uh, most of the audience so uh, i would like to uh, uh, with my pleasure, I would like to uh, uh, thank you once again for for uh, the the uh, webinar on uh, usage of sonar in underwater uh, operations. Uh, so uh, I would like to present this uh, token of appreciation. If you had been in uh, Sri Lanka, so that we could have met, but uh, uh, please accept our warm. Uh, uh, Thankfulness, gratefulness uh, for your delivery of presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much and give me the opportunity. And I have to say thanks for your president, Dr. Laksiri, give me that opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Chamil. And uh, before concluding the session, I would like to invite Engineer Sara to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you very much, Engineer Tanuk Suraj. And this is the fourth and the first webinar of January uh, 2023. So it's been a great uh, webinar as the start for the new year by our society committee. So I would like to present the vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank our speaker today, keynote speaker, Engineer Dr. B.S. Jayavardhana, who is an expert in underwater acoustics and surveillance. It's been a great uh, insight into the world of underwater acoustics. Thank you very much for your insightful uh, webinar. In fact, we uh, we are a lot of you know uh, outdated in terms of techniques in Sri Lanka, but we learned a lot from your webinar. I think it will be very much useful for uh, upcoming uh, great engineers like Engineer Tanj Suraj. And then I would like to thank you, our moderator. Engineer Tarantha Suraj for wonderfully moderating this webinar from the beginning to the end. And you wonderfully handled all the sessions, including the Q&A. I'd like to see you in our webinars in future as well. Next, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our president of Engineers Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, Dr. Kamal Laksiri, 
although he's not present here today, for introducing this amazing speaker to our sectional committee. So thank you, Dr. Kamal Laksiri. And finally, not, uh, not before final, but I would like to thank the staff of IESL for facilitating this webinar by providing the Zoom link and all the facilities associated with that. Last but not the least, dear participants, you made this webinar all the more interesting and energetic by your active participation and your questions. So keep coming for our webinars because we will be conducting more interesting webinars in the future as well. So with that, I would like to conclude my vote of thanks and hand over the control back to Tanju Suraj. With that, we have come to the end of this interesting session about usage of sauna in underwater operation. Before we conclude, I would like to remind you that this session is hosted by Electrical, Electronics and Tele Telecommunication Engineering Sectional Committee of IESL. So uh, keep in touch with us for uh, more interesting sessions hosted by the IESL Sectional Committee in Electrical, Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering. And have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.